Thank you. Well, I got so wrapped up in Evelyn's introduction, I almost forgot that I was going to have to speak myself. Um, but I would like to thank her for reminding me of my history and sharing some moments of that history with you. And I'd like to thank all of the many organizations uh, here who joined together to sponsor this event this evening. The end of racism begins with a sudden incomprehension. This observation at the end of France Fanon's Racism and Culture, which referred to the cultural crisis of the French colonialists vis-a-vis -vis the Algerian Revolution during the late 50s and early 60s, might also be associated with those who are presently arguing that efforts to rethink and restructure university education in accordance with the progress we have achieved in our historical consciousness, that is to say, consciousness of racism, of male dominance, of homophobia, and other forms of social oppression, that these efforts constitute little more than fanatic assaults on established principles and canons. This is one of those institutions where there's been a great deal of discussion on, what do they call it, uh, political uh, correctness. <laughs> but I want to go on to say that there is also incomprehension as to why some of us might be interested in challenging and protesting the quincentennial celebration of Columbus's arrival in the Americas. I specifically did not say discovery because actually he and his crew were discovered <laughs> by the indigenous people who greeted them. Likewise, there is the appearance of incomprehension as to why anti-apartheid activists are calling for the continuation of sanctions. After all, South Africa is supposed to be moving in an irreversibly democratic direction, they say. But Fennel continues, the spastic and rigid culture of the colonialists liberated finally opens itself to the culture of a people who have become fraternal, and I would say sisters and brothers. Um, the two cultures can now confront each other and enrich each other. If we look at the situation in this part of the world, and in that part of the world as well. I think we can say that the colonialists, or the racists, the misogynists, the homophobes, or rather the social system that depends so much on these oppressions for its self-affirmation, have not moved beyond rigidity beyond a desperate claim of universality. And as a matter of fact, the contemporary pervasiveness of violence is a symptom of this rigidity. And that's what I want to talk about this evening, violence. And specifically, two forms of violence. Two forms of violence that have acquired a distinctly counter-revolutionary dimension. First of all, I want to talk about the violence in contemporary South Africa that has become so ubiquitous that it is simply referred to now in South Africa as the violence. And everyone is talking about the violence. This violence is one of the main obstacles to the development of a free and democratic South Africa. I also want to address that phenomenon we have come to call 
hate violence in North America? The observations I want to make on the violence in South Africa are largely based on a trip I made to South Africa a couple of months ago. The observations on hate violence are situated within the context of my own political practice, specifically in relationship to the counter-celebration in 1992 led by organizations of indigenous people in the Americas. How many of you followed Mandela's recent trip to this country? Yeah, he was here in Boston. Did you know that? <laughs> Mandela visited this country between the 2nd and 9th of December. He just left a couple of days ago. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I say that because I think it's important for you to reflect upon the extent to which the information that you have is controlled, totally controlled. How many of you knew that Mandela was here in June of 1990? Everybody, right? And what is happening now in South Africa is that... Um, Progressive organizations led in the first place by the ANC are working hard to build the foundation for a new South Africa, not some utopian dream that a de Klerk might make reference to. And when Mandela was here, he spoke, among other places, um, at the United Nations. We can see, he said, rising on the horizon, the new glorious entity which shall no longer be spoken of as the pariah among the nations, the detestable example of what is impermissible in the ordering of human relations, the homeland of a crime against humanity. We are beginning to see emerge a new country which because it arrives so late at the festival of liberty must surely value freedom like the apple of its eye and strive hardest to live up to the dream of all humanity throughout the ages for emancipation, prosperity, happiness, and peace. I met with Nelson Mandela on several occasions during my visit to South Africa. Um, and I made a promise to him and to other members and leaders of the ANC and the ANC Women's League and the South African Congress of Trade Unions and other organizations that when I returned to this country, I would share with as many people as possible my immediate experience of the violence in South Africa. On the second day of my trip, I saw a group of black children playing among the broken gravestones in a cemetery in Alexandra Township on the outskirts of Johannesburg. That image frightened me. It conjured up my childhood fears of an immense cemetery located between my parents' house and the elementary school I attended in Birmingham, Alabama. There were, of course, circulating at school all manner of stories of ghosts and zombies uh, arising from this uh, cemetery. So that during the eight years I attended that school, my heart would always beat a little faster each time I walked those incredibly long two blocks next to the cemetery. But here were children in South Africa whose only playground was a cemetery, and for whom the gravestones served as a standing invitation to play hide and go seek. 
This image haunted me for the remainder of my trip, functioning as something of a metaphor for black people's lives in the townships there, living precariously but joyfully on the edges of death, living and fighting and singing and dancing on the ledges of life with the enduring hope of moving from the edge to the center, from the squatter camps, where one room cardboard shacks housing as many as eight people are literally constructed on garbage dumps out of sticks and, and, and cardboard, moving from those squatter camps to a solidly built house with at least three rooms, from the townships on the fringes of the city into the city itself, from a disenfranchised political status to full participation in a democratic South Africa. There were probably many people buried in that cemetery I saw in Alexandra Township whose lives had been claimed by the violence. This violence has been represented here in the United States as black-on-black -black violence. There was a period when every day we found newspaper articles and television programs on the black-on-black -black violence in South Africa. And it's true that most of the recent violence has been perpetrated by black people on other black people. But why do they call it black-on-black -black violence? Why do they privilege the, race, the racial dimension of that violence? When was the last time you heard about white-on-black violence? There's been a lot of that. <laughs> no, but I'm thinking of some dramatic incidents. For example, uh, the Rodney King uh, situation. Did anyone say that was white on black violence? Or white on native violence? Or as you said, white on white violence. World history is replete with white on white violence. And of course, there's also black on white violence. But what we hear about is black on black violence. Most of the media for, have foregrounded the fact that black people are killing black people because they want us to assent to an interpretation of this violence in South Africa as spontaneous outbreaks of age old tribal hostilities between the Kosas and the Zulu. There is an underlying agenda there. And that agenda, I believe, is the agenda of the de Klerk government. That agenda is to convey the message to the international community that black people in South Africa are not socially mature enough to merit participation in a democratic South Africa. If they are killing each other now, what would they do if they control the reins of power? And that is why we hear virtually nothing about the process unfolding at present in South Africa, about the fact that Nelson Mandela came to this country to appeal for support for a constituent assembly, first of all for a convention which is going to take place very soon, second of all for an interim government an interim government pending the election of a democratic government, pending the democratic election of a new government of South Africa, and a constituent assembly, an elected constituent assembly to draw up a new constitution for South Africa. And I want to know, you know why is it that when Mel Nelson Mandela is represented as the Messiah, as the personification of the possibility of a new order, a new world, he is 
abundantly covered by the media. But it is represented in a romanticized fashion, severed from the real practical activities that are required to build a democratic society, a non-racist, non-sexist, and hopefully non-homophobic society in South Africa in which working people are no longer exploited by those who control the resources and the wealth. I saw the violence. I saw moments of that violence. I saw members of Encarta with my own eyes, armed with guns and spears and sticks and shields on a number of occasions. One occasion was at a main intersection in Soweto. They were there, standing on the streets with their guns, with their spears and shields, which have been called traditional weapons and are allegedly outlawed. While it was shocking to see that with my own eyes, what I found even more shocking was the fact that on the other side of the street was a group of about 25 policemen watching them. <laughs> Apparently, guarding them. Who knows? They certainly weren't arresting them, although it was illegal for them to be standing there with weapons. And this became a familiar sight. A very familiar sight. Later that particular morning, I saw other groups of Nkatha members armed. At one point, we found ourselves driving behind an Nkatha mobilization, arms and all women and men, and they were wielding their weapons in the air. Behind them, or alongside them, was a large group of the South African Defense Forces in a hippo. And they simply watched. I saw another group of Nkata members gathered only a few hundred feet from the largest police station in Soweto. They were singing and chanting and raising their spears. And the police were standing outside the station. It appeared to me that the police had gathered to give their blessings to whatever Nkata had planned for the day. That evening when I returned to the hotel where I was staying and watched the evening news, I learned that people had been killed by that mobilization. And that numerous houses had been burned by that group I saw. As a matter of fact, I had stood on the spot where a number of houses were burned down. According to reports, there was no police intervention at all. No police intervention. So what is Nkata? Nkata Freedom Party led by Chief Butelezi the Zulu chief, Butulezi. It is an organization which has existed since, I think, 1984, and initially was founded in Zululand, in the Natal, by people who were in solidarity with the ANC as a means of creating a support system inside the Bantustan in the Natal for the struggle for a free and democratic South Africa. I don't have time to go into all of the details of its history. But what I do want to share with you is the fact that the first victims of the violence were not Kosa people. The first victims of the violence were Zulus. Zulu students 
who, as the character of the organization began to change, decided that they did not want to be a part of a movement they considered to be clearly backward and to a certain extent in collusion with the apartheid government. Students who attempted to leave in Qatar were the first to be killed. And the violence as it unfolded was visited, visited largely on initially Zulu people in the Natal. Now, of course, it is being constructed as tribal violence. Zulus against Kosas. Many of the Zulu members of Nkata live in hostels, live in single-sex hostels, which were, which are a peculiar feature of apartheid, constructed in order to provide housing for workers defined by apartheid policy as migrant workers. Since the system of apartheid relegated virtually the entire black population to separate areas that are called Bantustans or homelands, depending on their ethnic background, a network of hostels was erected in order to house the people apartheid considered not as human beings, but rather as units of labor power as units of labor. And many of these hostels continue to function. They were designed to break up family formations, particularly in the cities. There are male-only hostels, and there are a few female hostels. Even if a married man and woman from, say, the Siskai or from KwaZulu live and work in Johannesburg, they cannot live together. And this was especially true earlier, but it continues to be the case today. They must live separately in their respective hostels. The vision of apartheid was to create such hostels throughout the urban white areas, so that all, virtually all black people working in the all-white areas would be housed in hostels. The hostels have no places for children who must be left with their relatives um, in the homeland. In Soweto, while there are many male hostels still functioning, there's only one female hostel. And this, of course, indicates the original apartheid conception of women as mere appendages to male labor units. The only useful labor women were expected to perform was as domestic servants, as live-in servants. Therefore, they would be housed on the premises where they worked. In the areas I visited, I was told on numerous occasions that in Kata's stronghold is the hostels. And in Soweto, the hostels looked especially foreboding. They were generally surrounded by large spirals of barbed wire. Small windows indicated the small cell where as many as six or eight men lived together. Someone in Soweto told me that people in the community are often afraid to walk down the street where the hostels are situated for fear of being shot down by Nkata members. On several occasions, I saw the police transport vehicles, which they call hippos because they're big, like hippopotamuses. Uh, um, and they look like these big oil tanks. And I don't know, perhaps 25 or 30 uh, policemen. They're always dressed in camouflage uh, um, uniforms are transported in these vehicles. South Africa is a police state. It is a police state. I have never seen such visible um, manifestations of the police power of the state as in South Africa. At one point, I, I stopped with the ANC people who were with me in front of one of the hostels in order to look at some of the houses on the opposite side of the street that had 
recently been burned down by Nkata uh, people in the hostels. And as a matter of fact, I was told that people who live directly across the street from the hostels are often the first targets of the violence. We were invited in um, a home by a woman who told us that she had just recently rebuilt her house uh, with the assistance of the Red Cross. Everything she had had been burned. Three doors down, she told us an older woman had died in the attack. And I looked at the interior of her home, uh, this newly constructed home. She had three rooms, and I noticed that all of the walls were bare except for one very beautiful cent centrally placed framed poster of Nelson Mandela uh, bearing the words, Viva ANC. This was a woman in her perhaps 40s living across the street from the hostel. I visited, among other places, a black township in the Natal, in, um, on the outskirts of Durban, called Richmond. In order to reach the road to Richmond, it was necessary to drive through a white town. The white people live in towns. Black people live in, and quote, colored people and Indian people live in town ships. Um, it was necessary to drive through this white town, which was uh, called Beaulieu, a beautiful place. And it was indeed a very beautiful white town. Uh, all of the lawns were manicured. There were large and imposing houses. Uh, but strangely enough, I did not see a single person. It was the, the most bizarre feeling. There was no one in the streets, no one sitting on a porch. I did not see a single inhabitant of that town. But as we approached Richmond, we saw soldiers laying barbed wire, which again was to become another familiar sight in an area that was probably going to become an encampment. Um, further down the unpaved road, we saw a big Nissan truck with about 50 soldiers seated, seated in the back with their weapons in view. These were soldiers. This was the army. It's not always um, possible to tell the army from the police. They all look the same to me. Um, but I was told that this was the army. Um, a little further down the road, we saw the burned out shell of a house which belongs to the local ANC chairperson. Apparently, it had burned down during the month of March uh, by Nkata. There was a red flag bearing the insignia of the South African Communist Party flying above this burnt out structure. We walked up to the house um, and I wanted to take some photographs. I took quite a few photographs there. And I saw just outside of the house two small children um, and I decided to try to take a photograph of them. And I, I pulled out my camera and aimed, uh, and both of them jumped back fearfully. And someone told me that they thought that the long lens on my camera was a gun. Um, and, you know, that was maybe the most unsettling moment I had. Uh, and it taught me more than all of the visible images of the violence, the extent to which this Violence is affecting the people of South Africa. Um, two small children, perhaps three and four years old, who thought, because I was attempting to take a picture of them, that I was going to kill them. Uh, and, And that made me feel very angry. It made me feel angry at myself for putting these children through that experience. It made me feel rage at the government. Um, so I played with them for long enough to uh, feel that I had at least uh, demonstrated to them that uh, I was not the enemy. Um, and not far from this house, there was an enormous encampment again, of the South African de Defense Forces. 
10 drab olive tents, barbed wire again surrounding it, sandbags stacked up as if for battle. And this is in the main road in the community. Um, as a matter of fact, that day was a Sunday. Uh, people were walking home from church and, and the image of you know, women in their Sunday meeting dress, uh, greeting each other on the street, coming from church uh, against the backdrop of this enormous military encampment. Uh, um, again, um, told me something about the extent to which the violence in South Africa comes not from tribal hostilities, but from the state. I interviewed many people on the street and asked, are they helping? Are they doing anything to stop the Encanta violence? And most of the people said, they felt that they were playing a col collaborationist role, that sometimes the army and Nkata would launch an attack together. You know, sometimes one group would stab a person and a soldier would shoot the same person. These are some of the experiences. I have an enormous amount of uh, information gathered from a few weeks in South Africa. But what I want to say now is that anyone who has seen the pervasive police presence in the township, to anyone who has seen that presence, it would be obvious that any absence, any absence of the police during rampages by Encarta would be a willed absence. A conscious decision to permit Encarta to burn and kill and maim. South Africa, as I said, is a police state. Everywhere you go, there are police. They are dressed in their mil military camouflage uniforms. They're armed with pistols and machine guns. Sometimes they have three or four guns. Uh, um, and single individual. They patrol the townships in these hippos, but also small yellow vans, and there's always one policeman who is standing up with the door of the van open, poised for battle. And I saw them following children in this way. Groups of children who had just returned from a funeral. Over 10,000 people have been killed since 1984, when the violence began in the Natal. During the incidents I mentioned when the students, the Zulu students were killed, over 10,000 people have been killed. In the last year, 2,000 people have been killed in the Transvaal alone, which is the area around Johannesburg. I would like to share with you some words I received from Nelson Mandela um, in the course of an interview. He said, there is no question of a clash between the Zulus and the Kosas, as the press is trying to suggest. No, it was originally a clash between the ANC and Nkata. But they know that the ANC commands the majority support and they are trying to intimidate the masses of the people, the residents. That is the role of Nkata, he said, to rise to power on the corpses of black people in this country. And Mandela went on to say, now de Klerk has his own agenda. Originally, this was a fight between the ANC and Nkata. De Klerk then sees this as an opportunity to destroy an organization which he considers as the main threat to white supremacy, the ANC. And he came in on the side of Nkata. And later, he actually took over the activities of Nkata. So Butelezi has now become a cog in a big wheel which he, has, which he can't control. And I imagine that Mandela was 
referring to the fact that it has been demonstrated that the government has funded in Qatar. While I was there, while I was there, there was this scandal which is now called in Qatar Gate <laughs> that everybody was talking about. Everybody was talking about in Qatar Gate. Of course, in Kata is not the only source of this violence. Um, it's not so simple. The structure of this violence is far more complex. The South African Defense Force, I learned, worked openly with criminals who are released, even those convicted of murder, in exchange for criminal services rendered to the police. Then there are the Askaris. These are people who were trained by Umkonto Siswe, which is the armed wing of the ANC, people who were trained by Umkonto Siswe, captured inside the country and threatened with hanging if they did not identify and often kill leaders and activists. Of course, not all members of Umkonto Siswe became Askaris, which means traitor, uh, but some of them did. And then there's also the CCB, the CCB, it's called the Civil Cooperative Bureau. Um, this group was formed by the army and it functions as a death squad, eliminating known leaders and activists associated with the ANC. Sections of the army which operated in Namibia, uh, there was one group called Kervert, and then an actual section of the army called the 37 but battalion, which were used to kill members of SWAPO. These groups are now operating inside South Africa, targeting members of the ANC. The function of this pervasive violence is to destabilize the ANC, which commands the support of the majority of the people in South Africa. The de Klerk government presents a facade of progress to the world even to the extent of signing the peace agreement back in October with the ANC, PAC, Azapo, and Nkata even. Bush, of course, with his friends in the West, then moved to begin to lift sanctions at a moment when these sanctions are most desperately needed by those who are fighting for a free South Africa. And let me say that what most impressed me during my visit to South Africa was the spirit of the people there, wherever I went. When I say the people, I'm talking about people I met in townships. I'm talking about people who were living in squatter camps. I'm talking about people who were living on gar garbage dumps. I'm talking about people who were living in refugee camps, who had all of their belongings um, burned and stolen and were run out of their townships. There was one moment when I was visiting a refugee camp that had been established by the uh, Red Cross, I think, in the Natal. Um, rows of pewter-colored tents uh, housed hundreds of people who were refugees from the violence. I arrived there at around sundown, and there was a fire burning. People uh, were complaining that they had no food, that the Red Cross had made a, a, a delivery of supplies in July, and this was in September. There were mostly women and children there. And the women were saying that they could not get jobs. They had no transportation. And they had virtually nothing. And that was one of those moments where I felt um, so sad and so angry. But I felt so powerless because there was really nothing I could do at that moment. I felt that if I had just had you know, boxes of food or money or something that I would have done whatever I could have to guarantee that, that all of those people could at least, you know, eat a meal that evening. 
But I found myself sort of sinking into a kind of um, state of um, pitying people who lived under those conditions and sort of in a very uncanny way, just as I was experiencing those emotions, a woman whose house had been totally destroyed by Enkata stood before the group that had gathered to greet us and said, Amanna! And all of the people there said, I'll wait too! And they began to chant and sing and dance. And I realized at that moment that it was me who was wrong. I should not have been feeling pity because the people of South Africa have established a record of struggle for generations and generations. And as a matter of fact, more than my being able to help them, they are going to help me. They are helping all of us. And this is the most critical juncture in the history of the South African people's quest for freedom and democracy. It is the most critical moment. And I want to know, why is it that we do not see people out in the streets demonstrating, getting arrested in front of the embassies as we did a few years ago? Why are we so quiet? Why are we so silent when this is the critical moment? This is the time that we should be involved in the kinds of activist efforts that will usher, not only that will assist in ushering South Africa to a new moment, but that will bring the entire world to a new historical moment. You know, but then, of course, if we don't see it on television, it's not happening. You see? I mean, I think that's what it is. But I want to know why. And we should be supporting the efforts to rewrite the Constitution there. The Constituent Assembly. I mean, a revolution is going on. What does the word constituent assembly remind you of? I mean, this is Harvard, right? You all should you know those references. Can you all study the French Revolution? Huh? Or do you not study that anymore? <laughs> but a revolution is going on. And there is no doubt in my mind that things are going to change. Um, I left South Africa with such enthusiasm, so invigorated. And I happened to be in South Africa at the time the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was outlawed when all of those events were happening in the immediate aftermath of the coup. And so I said, well, you know, South Africa is the center of world revolution right now. Wherever I went, people were organizing, talking about grassroots organizing. There were new organizations being launched. I mean, they call them launchings there. So whenever I would talk to people, they would say, well, we have to go to a launching of a women's league group here, and we have to go to another launching of the ANC there. We have to go to a launching of the SAC. I mean, there were launchings and launchings and launchings and more launchings. And it was so exciting to feel that energy which we could use in this country, particularly right now, especially right now. And the women, the women are doing it. The women are doing it. I mean, there are some problems within organizations like the ANC that have been traditionally male-dominated. And as a matter of fact, at the last conference, the women and the Women's League got together and, although they were not successful at this conference, has been placed on the agenda. They called for affirmative action 
within the ANC. I'm talking about within the ANC. And the women are in the process of organizing a massive grassroots movement in order to develop a women's charter that will be a part of the Constitution. This will be the first time, I believe, in the history of our times that the progress of the women's movement, of feminist movements all over, can be incorporated into a Constitution. But they're going to ask everybody who wants to make a suggestion first. Everybody who wants to make a suggestion as to what should be included in the women's charter will have the opportunity to, to at least present the suggestion. And it will, will be out of that that a women's charter will be eventually developed. And I can't tell you about all the songs and the dances about the women's charter and the, the cultural um, explosion that is accompanying this. But I must um, sort of hasten to conclude my remarks. And I did say that I was going to say some words about hate violence. Um, now, first of all, George Bush. Uh, let, let me go back to uh, South Africa, Africa for a minute to sort of create a stage for the next discussion. George Bush is still, um, has refused to keep in place economic sanctions against South Africa. Same George Bush, the same George Bush whose history is with the CIA, never forget that. Uh, is responsible for the nomination and very bizarre confirmation of Clarence Thomas. <laughs> if you're wondering why I so abruptly uh, changed subjects uh, using Bush as a convenient vehicle, uh, it's because I want to suggest that there's a kinship between Clarence Thomas and Chief Butalezi. Uh, <laughs> And fortunately, Thomas is not a chief, not quite a chief, but almost there. <laughs> Both Butelezi and Thomas represent a seemingly contradictory moment in the quest for racial equality and by extension, class, gender, sexual equality. But this contradictory dimension of their roles is nothing new. There has always been a collaborationist impulse in the struggle for black liberation and in most struggles. Not only here and in South Africa, in Africa, but throughout the diaspora. What is new is the overt, flaunting posture of the government vis-a-vis -vis this collaborationist posture, vis-a-vis -vis this, this impulse to collaborate. In times past, the Thomases and the Butelezis would have been dealt with, but they would have hardly made it into the vestibule, much less into the parlor. <laughs> now, of course, I would venture to say the de Klerk government would much rather see Butelezi as the first black president of South Africa than Nelson Mandela. And of course, a black man who opposes affirmative action, who was against women's reproductive rights, who has proven himself, and I found Anita Hill's compel, uh, testimony to be the most compelling of, 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 the, of all of the hearings. You know, but this man who opposes affirmative action, who was against women's reproductive rights, uh, is a uh, perfect, and a choreographer of a triumphant phallocentrism. <laughs> which is secured by manipulatively calling up the historical specter of lynching. You know, this time around, the high-tech kind. And this time around with CT as the victim. 
When Nelson Mandela made his tour of the United States in the aftermath of his release, he made a very moving speech. Um, referring to a moment of meeting with a group of Native American people in the Bay Area. In his speech, he spoke about the desire to further learn about the life conditions of Native people. And he promised to return to the US for the purpose of pursuing his contacts with the indigenous community here. During next year, only a few days away, during the year 1992, Native people throughout the country and on both continents of the Americas will lead a movement protesting the Columbus celebrations. <laughs> Nelson Mandela has been invited, Nelson Mandela, not Butelezi. Nelson Mandela has been invited to address an enormous mass meeting in Oakland on October 12, 1992. I promise to share with you some of my own practical experiences in the 1992 counter celebration. I am working with a group called Unified Against Genocide, 1992. And we're working in solidarity with the defiance campaign, the 1992 defiance campaign to show that the genocidal violence visited among the indigenous people of the Americas beginning in 1492 established a historical precedent for the brutal and violent horizon that is shared in the first place by racism here and in South Africa alike but also religious bias, homophobia, sexism, as well as other forms of oppression and marginalization. We have come to use the term hate violence for want of a more lucid term, because it really is not about hate. It is about a, an impulse that is promoted by the socioeconomic system under which we live, and the politics of the various oppressions related to the violence. But we use this term hate violence because I think we want to express the fact that there is something kindred about the physical and verbal violence and harassment so many of us suffer. Even though these violent dimensions of repression have their own respective uniqueness, depending on the structure of the oppression that is imposed on the particular community. And of course, many of us are members of interweaving communities. Uh, but even in those ex instances where some of us may have no direct experience of the hate violence, we need to grasp it in palpable ways, and we need to learn how to fight it together in solidarity. One of the ways we can understand this kinship between ourselves, our sisters and brothers in South Africa, in the Middle East, in Nicaragua, in Cuba, is by educating ourselves with respect to the historical roots of these pervasive and proliferating contemporary expressions of violent bias. So that as an African-American woman, I can talk about the slave trade and slavery and lynching as some of those historical moments that have constituted anti-black violence over the years. But the slave trade would have been inconceivable if Columbus had not made his voyage to this part of the world in 1492. And I think we can make statements about virtually every other racially oppressed, marginalized group that will clearly place racist violence in some kind of relation to the colonization 
process that was initiated by Columbus's party, um, by the fact that Columbus stumbled upon these shores, lost, <laughs> and was discovered. <laughs> so there's palpable evidence of the legacy of genocide in this country and South Africa, throughout the world, 500 years after Columbus. We have the habit of enumerating um, all of our various you know, communities, um, particularly when we talk about hate violence, and we talk about the native people, the Jewish people, the African American people, the Arab people, the Asian people, the Latino people, the Chicano, the Puerto Rican, gay and lesbian, um, men and women, Pacific Islanders, and you know, we can go on and on. Uh, um, and sometimes I think, we feel that just by calling the names of all of these communities, we have consolidated ties. Um, as if all we have to do is enumerate. Well, of course, institutions like this create an enormous amount of confusion about the relationship between theory and practice. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and theory has a very interesting way of masquerading as practice. Uh, you know, but what, to what extent have we actually built bridges? Uh, or is the bridge an appropriate metaphor? Uh, I don't know, maybe we should talk about tunnels. Because it seems as if only a few of us have learned how to uh, move through those tunnels and to maneuver, uh, negotiate our way in cultures other than our own. And then, of course, there are those who are so oblivious to cultural differences that they don't recognize the problem. They feel that anybody who doesn't act like them or talk like them or see like them or listen like them or dance like them uh, is uh, an aberration. Yeah. 